Yeah. Welcome everyone here tonight. So if you can grab a seat, that'd be great. I was asked earlier if anything like this has ever taken place before in UConn, if you've ever had a big creation evolution type debate, and I'm not aware that we have, so we really want to welcome you to be a, a part of this uh, exciting uh, evening together tonight. We're going to be talking about does molecular genetics support human evolution. Here's the layout of what we're doing tonight. 20 minutes presentation offered to both sides. Uh, Dr. Charles Jackson on the creation side, Abby Smith on the evolution side. And uh, we flipped a coin, actually, to decide who would go first. And uh, Dr. Jackson's going to be going first. I don't know if it's better to go first or to be last, but 20 minutes presentation, 20 minutes presentation, 10 minute rebuttal, 10 minute rebuttal, and then open for questions from you, which I think will be a very exciting time. And the question is, how long do we stay afterwards for, for a question and answer time? And the answer was, as long as people want to stay, they're willing to stay. Okay, they don't want you leaving here frustrated, not knowing the answers to the questions that you might have. So we'll stay as long as necessary. So we welcome you tonight. And uh, there's going to be PowerPoint presentations. Um, the, it is being videoed, and there'll be a video tape available later in a month or so, uh, available if you want to uh, get a copy of this also. So we're just going to begin. Uh, Dr. Jackson is a scientist with Creation Truth, and Abby is a research uh, student at uh, OU uh, Health Science Center. So we have two very qualified people that are going to be talking about the uh, evidence for um, molecular evolution, okay? So we welcome them. Let's give a great big welcome and we'll let Dr. Jackson in. I'm a timekeeper too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So tell me when the time is being kept. Are you keeping time now? Okay. Go. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, as you might know, this stemmed from some letters to the editor of the local newspaper uh, banding some he said, she said stories back and forth. And uh, now we're going to actually do some he said, she said scripted instead of just stories. And it's, of course, about does molecular genetics support human evolution? And most people have heard of the DNA molecule. Uh, if that sounds like a big word to use there, we're talking about DNA molecule, we're talking about chromosomes, we're talking about uh, genes and genetic sequence. This is uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, he was played by Matthew Broderick in the movie Infinity. He was the scientist who discovered how come a space shuttle blew up in the 1980s, and he says this about science, very astute saying. Science is a long history of learning how not to fool ourselves. And I think anyone working in science has got to watch out for that. I think anyone going in any kind of an endeavor that uh, has any wiggle room for what's really happening and what's not needs to watch out for fooling ourselves. This is uh, Dr. Milford Wolpa from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he said this in the book Paleo uh, Paleoanthropology. I believe a physical, phys philosophical framework is not something that can be eliminated in order to provide objectivity. In my view, objectivity does not exist in science. Even in the act of gathering data, decisions about what data to record and what data to ignore reflect the philosophical framework of the scientists. If anyone tells you they're 100% objective, they're lying, at least to themselves. I'm not. I interpret all new scientific data through the creationary lens, the creation paradigm. But we have to watch ourselves with these uh, things that we have. Now, I attended the, the uh, talk by Richard Dawkins at the Field House a couple weeks ago, and uh, one of the things he said, coming from his paradigm, was science answers the how question. The why question is just a silly question. The question is an inappropriate one. So here a question is being labeled inappropriate by a scientist. I also attended uh, when uh, Michael Roos spoke at the music building. He said about intelligent design, I'm not saying that it's a bad answer, I'm, I'm saying that it's not a scientific one. Some answers just aren't appropriate. So in certain paradigms, some questions are appropriate to ask. Some answers, though they might not be bad ones, are still inappropriate to offer. These things are ways that we can fool ourselves. Does molecular genetics support ev human evolution? We're talking about DNA, we're talking about DNA sequences, and we're talking about the evolution of human beings. 
This is a chart showing, yes, different kinds of apes and then the human here. We don't disagree about what's above the tip of the iceberg. What we disagree about is how we all got here. Sure, chimps are very similar to us and, uh, and the, uh, the great apes, but how did we get here? Two different stories. Many evolutionary scientists have recently expressed doubts about the validity of molecular genetics evidences for evolution. This is Dr. Wolpuff again. He's in Science News Magazine this time in 2004. How many of you ever heard of mitochondrial DNA or mitochondrial Eve? Okay, so then you have some familiarity with what they're talking about there. Those who use mitochondrial DNA or the mitochondrial clock to reconstruct animals' evolutionary histories assume that its chemical sequence changes only at random, but mounting evidence indicates that natural selection molds the makeup of mitochondrial DNA, making such analyses useless because the clocks really don't run evenly. Also, I attended the lecture of uh, Dr. Soltis, uh, who uh, spoke at the uh, Sam Noble Museum just a short while ago also, and she said on the molecular DNA clock, she said, we, don't, we know that it doesn't tick evenly, regularly, or the same in all species, and you wouldn't you know, trust a watch like that either. I'm not saying that they're totally off on this, but I am saying that some people are just vesting in hopeful thinking. Now, a lot of times evolutionists like to point out that humans and, uh, and chimpanzees are so very, very much alike. And it's true. We are more physiologically and structurally the same uh, to chimpanzees than anything else. Out of 3 billion base pairs, 1.23% is the only difference. That's still 36 million base pairs, but we still have, what is it, 98 some odd percent the same DNA as chimpanzees. Well, they look the most like us of anything. It's not so surprising that structure and genetic coding would be the similar. But here's a nematode worm, microscopic, only has a thousand cells in its whole body, and this we have a 75% similarity with in our DNA. You know, all living things have similar DNA, some more than others. Now, here's the kicker, bananas share 50%, the same DNA as we do. Now, I'm not making this kind of stuff up. All living things do. Now, if those similarities between those very, very different kinds of organisms compared to us exist, then it's certainly not surprising at all. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we evolved from monkeys. If they were created the same time as humans, and they look a lot like humans, it's not surprising that their DNA would be very similar to humans, too. So that issue is transparent to the entire thing about uh, evolution and creation and whether humans evolved uh, from uh, chimpanzees or not. Now, I wanted to emphasize that our DNA really is very similar. If you look at this here, here's a, here's a karyotype of uh, human, chimp, gorilla, and orangutan uh, chromosome number 12, 13, and human chromosome number 2. And look what it says here, of these four species, chromosomes 6, 13, 19, 21, 22, and X have identical banding patterns. When you look at them through the microscope, you can see that these look almost like carbon copies of each other. Chromosomes 3, 11, 14, 15, 18, 20, and Y look the same in three of the four species, those being the gorilla, chimp, and humans. And chromosomes 1, uh, 2P and 2Q, which is the, uh, the human 2, um, and, and the chimp 12 and 13, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12, and 16 are alike in two species. Only chromo chromosomes 4 and 17 are different among all of them. The biggest single chromosomal rearrangement among, for the four species is the unique number of chromosomes, 23 pairs, found in humans as opposed to apes. Now, this is something evolutionary scientists are fond of pointing out, that chimps have uh, 24 pairs, humans have 23 pairs, and that that second human chromosome looks an awful lot like the combination of chimp 12 and 13. Well, indeed it does. Now, what they're saying is that uh, chimps and humans were hanging around, and then these two fused, and look at how similar they are, and now in humans we've got just chromosome 